Hello, friends. We'd like to welcome everybody to the weekend meeting. We have a nice public talk we're going to be able to enjoy along with our Watchtower discussion. To begin with, we'll be able to sing song number 65, Move Ahead. So I invite you to uh, sing along. So we'd like to look forward to our public talk for today. We have Brother uh, Brandon Cook coming from the East Beacon, New York congregation. And he has a theme, Move Ahead with Jehovah's Unified Organization. Mankind faces big problems. And man has made many organizations to try to address those problems. There are problems with health, the pandemic. So man has made organizations to deal with that. There's problems with social injustice. Man has made organizations to handle that. There are problems with climate change. Man has made organizations to address that. However, we know that mankind is limited. Even with good intentions, man can only do so much. There's only so much money, resources, and time that man can use. And even if man had all that they needed, they still wouldn't be able to correctly address the issues. They wouldn't even be able to agree on a solution. Well, we know that there is a solution and that Jehovah God has an organization and his organization is going to fix all of the problems that exist. What we're going to do today is talk about how we know that Jehovah his organization is on the move. It is dynamic. We have a place in it, and we can move ahead with it. Let's start off by first seeing how we can be so sure that Jehovah has the power and the wisdom to address man's problems. We'll start by looking at some verses in the book of Job. Please open your Bible to Job chapter 38. And we're going to look at a few verses, verses 31 through 33. And here, Job is being talked to by Jehovah through a windstorm. And Jehovah is giving Job some perspective. Notice what Jehovah says, Job 38, verse 31. Can you tie the ropes of the Kaima constellation or untie the cords of the Kiesel constellation? Can you lead out a constellation in its season? 
or guide the ash constellation along with its suns? Do you know the laws governing the heavens? Or can you impose their authority on the earth? You notice in these verses, Jehovah mentions three constellations. One of these constellations that he mentions is the Kiesel constellation. And we know that constellation now as Orion. And we see that in the picture here. Now, what have you learned about constellations in school or later? Well, we know that those stars, although they look like they're close together, they are very far apart from one another. And they're very far from the Earth. If you look at the top right bright yellow star in the Orion constellation, that star is called Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is hundreds of light years away from the Earth. How far is it from the other stars? If you look at those middle three stars, the center one is four times as far from Earth as Betelgeuse. Yet every night, those stars in the Orion constellation maintain their fixed relative positions with one another. And that's the way it is to the whole night sky. It's so reliable that mankind can even navigate by means of the stars. Why are they like that? It's like Jehovah said in verse 33, he established the laws governing the heavens. Jehovah has the ability to organize, especially when we consider how many stars there are. One estimate says that there are 300 sextillion stars. Look at that number. That is 3 trillion times 100 billion. That's a three with 23 zeros after it. That is a number we can't even wrap our heads around. And yet, who put those stars there? Who had the idea of creating one star with its power? And who was able to place many stars, 300 sextillion stars in the universe? Now, we know that the stars do move over time, so their relative positions will change. However, what we see night after night is the same fixed position. Jehovah's ability to organize his wisdom and power unmatched. And man has seen that he even has the stars organized. Not mankind's drawing out of organizing stars, but they have seen stars are organized into galaxies. Galaxies can have billions or even trillions of stars. Galaxies are organized into groups. Groups of galaxies are organized into clusters. Clusters of groups of galaxies of stars are organized into superclusters. Who did it? Jehovah God. Think of all the organization it takes to keep all of these celestial bodies moving. And now think of the organization sometimes it takes for us to keep our closets organized. Jehovah is amazing. He's awe-inspiring. And that organization that he has extends also to his intelligent creation. There's a large number of angels in heaven. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 10, it says that there were 10,000 times 10,000 angels before him in heavenly court. That's 100 million angels. Imagine a stadium with 100 million people in it who all go to meet at the same time to discuss something. No problem for Jehovah. On earth, we as Jehovah's Witnesses are organized. Throughout the world, we have different branches. Branches within those have regions. We have circuits. Within circuits, there are congregations. Within the congregations, there are field service groups. The organization comes right along down the line because we are worshiping Jehovah, the God of organization. Well, here's a question. Is all of the organization that we see just for the sake of keeping things neat and orderly so that Jehovah doesn't lose things? Well, there is purpose in Jehovah's organization. The heavenly part, and the earthly part of Jehovah's organization, we are unified to carry out his will. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, it mentions that there was an angel in mid-heaven who had everlasting good news to declare to those who dwell on the earth to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. So although we as Jehovah's Witnesses 
have the work of speaking to people, of writing letters, calling them on the phone, the angels support the preaching work. They help direct it. And we know there are so many examples. Maybe that was the case with you, where people are at a crossroads in their life. They don't know what to do. Maybe they cry out to God for help, and then they hear the knock on the door. Or maybe they saw the literature cart. Or maybe they received a letter in the mail or got a phone call. And on our end, we know we had no insight onto the situation, but the angels do. Jehovah uses the heavenly part of his organization along with the earthly part to accomplish his will. On our website, we learn how many languages we preach in. And that's significant because in Revelation 14, verse 6, it said that that angel had everlasting good news to declare to people of every tongue. So how many tongues do we preach in? Well, on JW.org, our website's translated in over 1,040 languages. And those languages are not just languages spoken by tens of millions of people or hundreds of thousands of people even. Some of them are spoken by just a small group. For example, Albanian Sign Language has less than 10,000 speakers or those who sign that language. So why do we put so much effort, so much time and resources into translating? A global company would not invest money to try to reach a very small group of people. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't make any sense. So why do we do it? What's the big picture? What's the purpose? Let's find out. Ephesians chapter one. Ephesians chapter one. And we're going to look at verses eight through 10. Here the apostle Paul writes about Jehovah. This undeserved kindness he caused to abound toward us in all wisdom and understanding by making known to us the sacred secret of his will. It is according to his good pleasure that he himself purposed for an administration at the full limit of the appointed times to gather all things together in the Christ, the things in the heavens and the things on the earth. So what is the purpose? Why are we doing the preaching work? What does Jehovah want to happen? Like it says at the end of verse 10, his purpose is to gather all things together in the Christ. The things in the heavens being those 144,000 who will rule with Jesus and the things on the earth. All of us who will enjoy everlasting life on the earth. And what does he use to that end? Verse 10 says that he has an administration or a, man a managerial procedure for doing things. He has an organized way to accomplish that. And it's not just because he needs to keep things neat and organized and not lose them, make sure everything's in place. Although he is wise and understanding, verse 9 says that it's according to his good pleasure. It makes Jehovah happy to see us working along with his will. How can we contribute to the unification of Jehovah's organization? What can we do besides the preaching work to show that we are going to move ahead and work right along with his purpose? The Apostle Paul explained a few chapters later in Ephesians chapter 4. Let's look at the first three verses and notice five qualities that we can show. Ephesians 4 verse 1 starts off, Therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, appeal to you to walk worthily of the calling with which you are called, with all humility and mildness, with patience, putting up with one another in love, earnestly endeavoring to maintain the oneness of the Spirit and the uniting bond of peace. So I see those five qualities that Paul mentions here, humility, mildness, patience, love, peace. How do those qualities contribute to unity, to good organization? Well, it's easy to think about it if we think of the opposite qualities. What are some opposites of humility, mildness, patience, love, and peace? Well, how about pride, hate, impatience. And when we see those things in the world, what do we see? Divisions, cultural superiority, racial superiority, national superiority. But as Jehovah's Witnesses, we avoid those qualities and instead we focus on showing the ones that contribute to the uniting bond of our brotherhood. So 
how is Jehovah's organization unified? Well, the heavenly part and the earthly part work together with the preaching work. And we can contribute to the, the unity, not only by the preaching work, but also by our Christian personality. There are many other qualities that we can display. But as we do that, we are helping out in contributing to that unification, to that unity. Now, how can we be sure that Jehovah is actively working now to accomplish his purpose? That he didn't just write or have the scriptures written for us so that a few thousand years later, we could kind of look back and see what to do and then kind of deal with things as they happen. How do we know that his organization is on the move? Well, Jehovah wants us to remember that his organization is dynamic. And he has revealed some things in the scriptures to help us know that. One thing that he did was he gave Ezekiel a vision of a celestial chariot. That celestial chariot representing Jehovah's heavenly or the heavenly part of Jehovah's organization. Let's look at a few of those features of the celestial chariot. Ezekiel chapter 1. We'll notice some of the features and also how it affected Ezekiel. Just as a basis for this, Ezekiel 1 verses 4 and 5 mentions a couple features of this vision. In the middle of verse 4, Ezekiel sees a huge cloud and flashing fire. Verse 5, he describes four living creatures. So here in this uh, huge cloud flashing fire, the four living creatures, he sees with them the celestial chariot. Let's look at a few verses and see what or how he describes it. Verse 14, he says, and when the living creatures would go forth and return, their movement had the appearance of flashes of lightning. Verse 17, he describes the wheels of the chariot. He says, when they moved, they could go in any of the four directions without turning as they went. Their rims were so high that they inspired awe, and the rims of all four were full of eyes all around. Verse 20 says they would go where the Spirit inclined them to go, wherever the Spirit went. The wheels would be lifted up together with them, for the Spirit operating on the living creatures was also in the wheels. Now, what do we see in the picture here? This celestial chariot. And you remember what we read in verse 14? That the chariot moved like flashes of lightning. We see the lightning in the picture, able to move in an instant. Verse 15, or verse uh, 17, says that the wheels can go in any direction without turning. When we drive a car and we want to turn to the right or left, we have to slow down. We may even have to stop to turn. Jehovah's organization doesn't have to do that. The rooms were so high in verse 18, they inspired awe. Verse 20 says they would go where their spirit inclined them to go. Jehovah, using his Holy Spirit, his active force directs his chariot. He can move long distances with these large wheels depicted by the celestial chariot. The eyes all around, we've learned before, show how he can look far off into the distance. So that gives us a glimpse of the action in the heavens, the way things go. Now, how did Ezekiel feel about this? Look at this next picture from our pure worship book. We see how Ezekiel is in awe. He is overtaken by this tempestuous wind, by this magnificent sight of the celestial chariot. The trees are even bending. I love what it says in our pure worship book. Chapter 3, paragraph 20. It says, Ezekiel's vision at this point may move us to ask ourselves, am I really in awe of Jehovah's chariot? We need to remember that the chariot represents a reality that exists right now. Never should we imagine that Jehovah, his son, and all the angels might be blind to some problem that discourages us. Nor should we worry that our God will be late in responding to our needs, or that his organization will fail to adapt to some new challenge arising in the volatile world around us. We do well to remember that Jehovah's organization is active, ever on the move. Don't you feel that that's the case? Haven't you seen that in the last uh, year and a half of the pandemic? how we've moved to Zoom for our meetings, how things have happened so quickly, and Jehovah's organization responds. Sometimes we've been ahead of the governments with some of the changes we've made. 
It's not because of mankind's wisdom. It's because Jehovah is behind that chariot. Now, how do we see other ways that his organization is on the move reflected in the earthly part of his organization? We'll look at two prophecies in the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 60, that show that his organization is on the move. Isaiah 60. The first one that we'll look at has to do with organizational refinements. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 17. We read here, instead of the copper, I will bring in gold. And instead of the iron, I will bring in silver. Instead of the wood, copper, and instead of the stones, iron. And I will appoint peace as your overseers and righteousness as your task assigners. So you see what is indicated in this verse? An improvement of materials. Copper becoming something better, gold. Iron becoming something better, silver, and so on. So how does that indicate organizational refinements? Things keep getting better all the time. And the reason is because we understand the scriptures better. Because Jehovah reveals that understanding to the faithful and the street slave. One example that we've seen things get better, like copper turning to gold, is with the elder arrangement. Maybe you were alive many decades ago when we didn't have a body of elders as we have now, but there was a brother in the congregation who was the uh, company servant, later the, the congregation servant, the congregation overseer. And at that time, there were, without the body, he would make the decisions in the congregation. Well, in the late 1960s, the governing body studied the first century congregation to see how it was organized. And they saw that there was not just one elder taking the lead, but there is a theocratically appointed, qualified group of brothers, a body of elders. So there was a change then in 1972, a change like copper to gold, where now instead of the one brother, there was a body of elders who qualified according to the scriptures. Now, how is that an improvement like copper to gold? Well, here's three ways. One way is it reminds us that the head of the congregation isn't a man, but it's, Jeho it's Jesus Christ. And that actually helps to unify the heavenly part with the earthly part. A second way it's an improvement is there's an accomplishment through many advisors. Instead of one man having to make all the decisions, this group of theocratic, uh, scripturally appointed men consider different suggestions. They reach decisions together, considering the needs of the congregation and individuals. And those decisions harmonize with Bible principles. A third way that it's an improvement is it helps uh, us to be able to keep up with the growing needs in the congregation. Back in 1971, before the elder arrangement started as we know it today, there are 27,000 congregations. Now there's over 120,000 congregations. That growth is made easier by having bodies of elders. And Jehovah trains elders. Another improvement like iron to silver. Elders get training like the Kingdom Ministry School, like the school for the body of elder or the school for congregation elders. That type of improvement that type of training makes sense because we are in the end of the last days. And Jehovah wants his sheep, his witnesses, to be safe and protected and secure as we approach the great tribulation. And that leads us to another way that Jehovah is directing his earthly part of the, of the earthly part of his organization. And that's the last verse of Isaiah 60. Verse 22. This has to do with numerical growth. Notice this prophecy. The little one will become a thousand, and the small one a mighty nation. I myself, Jehovah, will speed it up in its own time. What does this indicate? A growth in, those, in the number of those who worship Jehovah. In 1960, 60, a little over 60 years ago, there were less than a million witnesses, 850,000 witnesses. Now, we have 10 times that many publishers. 
and that growth is seen in many countries. The pandemic hasn't stopped us. We've heard reports knowing that there, there have been increases, record increases in many countries of publishers. Who's responsible for that growth? Is it one or two very wise people around the world who thought, of, how can we get the numbers larger in this country and that country? No, verse 22 says, I myself, Jehovah, will speed it up in its own time. Verse 17 said, instead of the copper, I will bring in gold. Jehovah's doing this. He's making things better. He's causing the increase. This is the same one who made the stars. The same one who directs the chariot. The same one who shows us how to live. The qualities to display. Without a doubt, Jehovah's organization is dynamic. And the brotherhood is really amazing when we think of what's accomplished with imperfect people. And we see that unity on Zoom. During our midweek meetings, our weekend meetings, and when we're tied into Zoom or the ministry, we see all of our brothers and sisters in gallery view. We see the different cultures, the different backgrounds, the different ages, the different races, different languages. And we're unified, we're united. If you put a dozen people at a table, people who don't know Jehovah, strangers, different ages, races, backgrounds, languages, what will you get at that table? You might get silence. You might get arguing. You won't have unity. Now you take a, a dozen Jehovah's Witnesses and you put us around a table. People who we haven't even met. Different ages, races, backgrounds, ages, uh, languages. What do you get? An encouraging evening, laughter, maybe a good dinner after convention. It's completely different in Jehovah's organization. We are so united. The broadcast unites us. We see examples in brothers and sisters around the world who have completely different backgrounds going through the same types of problems as us. Jehovah's helping them out the same way. Without a doubt, Jehovah unites us. Why? Because he is in control of his chariot. The organizations that Satan has today, although some are working towards trying to make good improvements, they will be gone. Jehovah doesn't need those organizations. The organizations that go against Jehovah, he's going to wipe those out too. In the future, all of Satan's organizations will be destroyed. There will be universal harmony. So what do we do about it? Knowing that fact, what should we do? Let's find out what Peter said in our final verses. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 11 through 13. He says, since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, consider what sort of people you ought to be in holy acts of conduct and deeds of godly devotion as you await and keep close in mind the presence of the day of Jehovah, through which the heavens will be destroyed in flames and the elements will melt in the intense heat. But there are new heavens and a new earth that we are awaiting according to his promise. And in these, righteousness is to dwell. Since all these things are going to be dissolved, since Satan's organizations are going to be gone, since Jehovah is going to make things better, what do we do? Well, Peter exclaims to consider what sort of people we are. People in holy acts of conduct. What does that mean? What does it mean to have holy acts of conduct? That has to do with what we do. How do we act? How do we conduct ourselves? Are we known as humble, mild, patient, loving, peaceable people? Do we show the Christian personality with workmates, with schoolmates, with our family members? Absolutely, because we are considering what sort of people we are. The verse continued and mentioned deeds of godly devotion. What does that mean? Our deeds of godly devotion are things that we do that show our loyalty to Jehovah, how we are sticking to him. Things like Bible reading, our ministry, personal study, prayer. 
Those things are deeds of godly devotion. So we consider what we're doing. And what do we do? We give our best to Jehovah. And that makes him happy. Now the verse also, or those verses also mentioned in verse 12, as you await and keep close in mind the presence of the day of Jehovah. What does that mean to keep close in mind? Imagine a pregnant woman. Let's say she's pregnant for eight months. It's obvious she's pregnant. One day, is she going to go look in the mirror and say, oh my goodness, I forgot I'm pregnant. No, from the moment that she finds out she's pregnant, her perspective changes. Her goals may change. Where she lives may change. The paint on the wall may change. She has it close in mind. So we keep close in mind what's going to happen. Jehovah's Day. What's going to happen next? We're waiting for the cry of peace and security, the beginning of the great tribulation. And then what? The destruction of false religion, the attack of Gog and Magog, Armageddon. And then what? We see in this picture, the new heavens and the new earth, that unstoppable chariot will continue on forever. The rapid progress that we see in the fulfillment of Bible prophecy will continue and accelerate. We will enjoy the first day after Armageddon. We're going to get the new scrolls. Our minds and bodies will be made perfect. We will have a restored paradise earth. We're going to build houses and live in them. We're going to educate people with a new education. We are going to see our resurrected loved ones. We're going to live long enough to see the constellations change. All of that is in store for us as we stick to Jehovah's organization. Remember who's driving the chariot. Don't be a backseat driver. Enjoy the ride. Never forget that you and I are part of a universal organization that has been moving. Stick with it and move ahead with Jehovah's organization forever. Thank you very much, Brother Cook. Excellent job. You know, we, uh, it was good to think about uh, where we are in Jehovah's organization and actually where we're going. Very nice. Well, we can look forward to our Watchtower discussion next, and we'll invite Brother Ackerbloom to help us with that. So feel warmly welcome to our Bible lesson today. We have a wonderful discussion ahead of us about a very important subject. But let's first sing a song of praise to Jehovah. It's song number 36. Uh, it has the theme, We Guard Our Hearts. And as we will find out, it's a very appropriate song to start with this study with. So let's sing song 36.
So we have a very interesting article uh, ahead of us today. Uh, it's the study article number 40. It's the first article in the October study edition of the Watchtower. So the theme, as you see, is what is true repentance? And this is a very important subject because, as you see, the, the theme scripture for this lesson is what Jesus said. I have come to call sinners to repentance. So what is true repentance is the, uh, is the question. Is it enough to say, I'm so sorry? Well, we will learn the answer to this question in the theme of the study today by uh, looking at two kings, two contrasting examples, and also what Jesus said about a wayward son in one of his illustrations. And we will also see how this information is of great benefit for elders in the Christian congregation when they have to determine uh, if a fellow believer who has committed a serious sin is truly repentant. And so at the end of the study, we will come to a conclusion, or we could say a definition of what is true repentance. And maybe we can also keep in mind that the Bible often talks about fruits or works that befit repentance. So let's go into the study, and we have uh, Brother Saldanya with us to do the reading. So let's uh, listen to paragraph one and two, please. Let us look closely at two kings who lived in ancient times. One ruled over the ten-tribe kingdom of Israel, the other over the two-tribe kingdom of Judah. Though they lived at different times, they had a lot in common. Both kings rebelled against Jehovah and corrupted his people. Both were guilty of idolatry and murder. However, there was a difference between these two men. One of them pursued a wicked course to the end of his life, but the other repented and was forgiven for his terrible deeds. Who were they? Their names were Ahab, king of Israel, and Manasseh, king of Judah. The differences between these two men can teach us a lot about a very important subject, repentance. What is repentance and how is it shown? We need to know because we want Jehovah to forgive us when we sin. To find the answers to these questions, we will examine the lives of these two kings and see what we can learn from their examples. Then we will consider what Jesus taught about repentance. Thank you. So it's always nice to study together. So we look forward to all your comments. And uh, so here is the uh, paragraphs one and two then. How did two kings differ? And what questions will we consider? Uh, let's start with Sister uh, uh, Fortune, please. These two kings, Ahab and Manasseh, shared many things in common, but they did show the difference was evident when Jehovah disciplined them. They each responded differently to that discipline. Yeah, thank you. Very good. And uh, Brother Commerce, please. Yes, and we'll see in this article, it's the two questions is what is repentance and how is it shown? Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, Sister Cook, please. And that's a really, those are really important questions for us to consider because at Romans 3, 23, it says that we all fall short, sin and fall short of the glory of God. So we really need to understand what true repentance is so that when we sin, Jehovah will forgive us. Yeah, that's so true. Thank you very much. And we also have Sister uh, Trombley. And then we'll also consider what Jesus taught about repentance. Yeah, so we have a lot to look forward to. So let's go into the first subheading. Sub what we can learn from King Ahab's example. Paragraph three, please. Ahab was the seventh king of the ten tribe kingdom of Israel. He married Jezebel, daughter of the king of Sidon, a wealthy nation to the north. The marriage may have brought wealth into the land of Israel, but it also further damaged the nation's relationship with Jehovah. Jezebel was a Baal worshiper, and she incited Ahab to promote that despicable religion, which involved temple prostitution and even child sacrifice. No prophet of Jehovah was safe while Jezebel had power. She had many of them put to death. Ahab himself was worse in the eyes of Jehovah than all those who were prior to him. Jehovah was not blind to the actions of Ahab and Jezebel. He was totally aware of what they were doing. Mercifully, though, Jehovah sent the prophet Elijah to warn his people to change their ways before it was too late. 
but Ahab and Jezebel refused to listen. So, question to paragraph 30. What kind of king was Ahab? What kind of king? Uh, Brother um, Salgado, please. He was a very wicked king. Uh, as we can see in the account of First Kings, he did a lot of things to damage the relationship with uh, Yehovah between the people in Yehovah. He began to worship Baal. Also, she got married with Hezabel, that was a wicked woman that promoted false uh, religion, false worship, and also institute things like uh, uh, temple prostitution and child sacrifice, really very, very wicked things. Yeah, that was very bad. And uh, Brother Estrada, please. We can also note that in uh, 1 Kings 16.30, uh, Jehovah said he was worse than anyone prior to him. Indeed, he had a very bad reputation in the eyes of Jehovah. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, we also have Sister uh, Saldana. And we also see that together, they attacked Jehovah's prophets. Um, they had many of them put to death, and this, was not, this didn't make Jehovah very happy. Yeah, thank you. So let's continue to see more about Ahab now in paragraph 4. Finally, Jehovah's patience came to an end. He sent Elijah to pronounce sentence on Ahab and Jezebel. Their entire family line was to be wiped out. Elijah's words hit Ahab hard. Surprisingly, that arrogant man humbled himself. So what was the sentence pronounced on Ahab and how did he react? Uh, let's see. Let's have Brother uh, Woodley, please. Well, Jehovah uh, sent Elijah to pronounce uh, uh, sentence on Ahab and his whole entire family line was supposed to be wiped out. Uh, and so hearing on uh, these words, Ahab uh, humbled himself. Yeah, thank you. And um, we also have Brother uh, Walker. We're also able to learn uh, more about his humbling by in first kings chapter 21 verse 29 when jehovah sees ahab's heart he was moved to not bring the calamity in his lifetime so we know that jehovah can't be fooled he can read hearts so ahab was definitely on the right track yeah thank you good and then um, let's also have um brother commerce please we can imagine uh how King Ahab would have reacted to this because this was not a, a simple death. It's not you're going to die. It's not your family's going to die, but your the dogs will eat up Jezebel and the plot of the land. And as the account there in First Kings is mentioning, it says the dogs will lap up their blood. Uh, the birds will eat them. This would have been a, a, a significant visual to them. Yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, he, it says that he humbled himself and he did some things. Uh, mentioned there in uh, verses 27, 29, what were some of the things he did there? Uh, Sister uh, Olomo, please. When First Kings uh, chapter 21, verse 27, it states how Ahab ripped his garments apart and put sackcloth on, and he went on a fast. But as we continue throughout the paragraphs, we see that these were just emotions of regret and remorse. Yeah, thank you. Good. So let's remember that as we go on now to paragraph five and six, please. Although Ahab humbled himself on that occasion, his conduct afterward showed that he was not truly repentant. He did not try to remove Baal worship from his kingdom, and he did not promote the worship of Jehovah. Ahab showed his lack of repentance in other ways as well. Later, when Ahab invited good King Jehoshaphat of Judah to join him in the war against the, Assyrian, the Syrians, Jehoshaphat suggested that they first consult a prophet of Jehovah. Initially, Ahab rejected the idea, saying, There is still one more man, though, whom we can inquire of Jehovah. But I hate him, for he never prophesies good things concerning me, only bad. Even so, they consulted the prophet Micaiah. Sure, sure enough, the man of the God foretold bad news for Ahab. Rather than repentantly seeking Jehovah's forgiveness, Wicked Ahab had the prophet thrown into prison. Although the king managed to imprison Jehovah's prophet, 
he could not prevent the prophecy from coming true. In the battle that followed, Ahab was killed. So five and six, what suggests that Ahab, Ahab was not truly repentant? And we also have a picture there that we can tie in. Uh, let's have uh, uh, Sister Salgado, please. Yes, he, his conduct afterward showed that he was not truly uh, repentant. So he did not try to remove Baal worship from his kingdom. And also he did not promote the worship of his kingdom. Yeah, very true. Thank you. And uh, Sister Sean Baptiste, please. And rather than um, wanting to change himself and repent to gain Jehovah's favor after hearing Micaiah's uh, denunciation from Jehovah, we see at 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 27, that King Ahab had the prophet Micaiah thrown into prison, and he even uh, reduced his food and water rations. Yeah. So two, thank you. Uh, can we also have the picture there? Um, maybe we can comment on on um, some more that shows that he was not truly repentant. Uh, can we have uh, uh, Brother Estrada, please? We see here on the left-hand side of the picture, we see um, King Ahab uh, feeling sorry, probably ripped it open his sackcloth, but uh, really, uh, his conduct afterwards really determined if he was repentant. He threw this prophet into prison and he really um, it didn't show a lack of appreciation. Yeah, very true. Thank you. Um, we have the um, McDonald, please. Uh, it really hones in too. Um, it started really with what he didn't do. Uh, he didn't uh, act, he didn't remove Baal worship from the kingdom. Um, he didn't promote, he didn't try to go the other way and serve Jehovah. Uh, so even before he threw the prophet into prison, uh, he failed to act on things. So um, really the only thing he had done at this point was just have a display of remorse. Yeah, thank you. Good. And what did he call the prophet? That shows a little bit of his attitude. Called, he told him, oh, enemy, oh, my enemy. So that shows that he was not truly repentant. Okay, let's continue now to, in, in paragraph seven to see uh, uh, Jehovah's view of him. After Ahab died, Jehovah re re revealed how he viewed that man. When good King Jehoshaphat came home safely, Jehovah sent the prophet Jehu to, to rebuke him for having allied himself with Ahab. Jehovah's prophet said, is it the wicked you should be helping? And is it those who hate Jehovah you should love? Now consider, if Ahab's repentance had been genuine, surely the prophet would not have described him as a wicked man who hated Jehovah. Clearly, although Ahab had shown a degree of regret, he never fully repented. So how did Jehovah describe Ahab after his death? How did Jehovah describe him? Um, let's have uh, Brother Cook, please. Jehovah showed that his feelings toward Ahab really hadn't changed because he said uh, through the prophet Jehu, um, he referred to Ahab as wicked and as one who hated Jehovah. Now, previously, Elijah, quoting Jehovah, as we had read in one of those previous verses, said that Ahab was acting in the most detestable way and that there is no one like him who had determined to do what was bad in Jehovah's eyes. So things just, he hadn't shown any real repentance. No, that's, that's very true. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Sister Cook, please. And what we know about Jehovah is that he remembers the good that people do. He doesn't hold on to past mistakes to bring it up. So if he was truly repentant, we know that Jehovah wouldn't have referred to him as wicked. No, that's very true. Thank you. Good point. Okay. So let's go on with the uh, paragraph eight, where we will uh, draw the conclusions of this example with Ahab. So paragraph eight, please. What can we learn from Ahab's example? When we heard Elijah's message of calamity against his family line, Ahab initially humbled himself. That was a good start. 
but his later actions showed that he was not repentant at heart. Repentance, then, must involve more than temporarily expressing sorrow. Let us consider another example that will help us understand what true repentance involves. So what can we learn about repentance from Ahab's example? Uh, let's have uh, Sister Trombley, please. We learn that repentance involves more than just temporary sorrow, but it comes from the heart and it must be followed by actions. Yeah, that's very true. Thank you. And uh, uh, let's have Brother Woodley. Yes, and uh, a brother always used to tell me, you know, it, it, it don't matter how you start. It's about how you finish. And then uh, even though Ahab had a good start, uh, he didn't finish well. He didn't follow through um, because he didn't make the necessary changes uh, to let Jehovah know that he was truly repentant. So it's a good example for us. You know, if, you know, it don't matter how we start. You know, if we're truly repentant, we'll follow through and show, Jeho show Jehovah that we are really truly sorry. Yeah, very, very true. Thank you. And uh, Brother uh, Salgado, please. So this um, teaches a very important lesson about true repentance. It's not just that initial sorrow, but it needs to follow with actions. So true repentance is identified by the actions that follow. And in the case of Ahab, he had not any of those actions. No, that's so true. Thank you. Thank you for emphasizing that. So he did have some actions. But were they signs of true repentance? Um, Brother Woodley, please. No, they were not. Yeah, thank you. And Brother Walker? Yeah, just to go along with that, he didn't take any real action. Uh, he still kept going with Baal worship. He didn't try to encourage serving Jehovah. So there wasn't any real action that took place on his part. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for your uh, nice comments. It's great to, to listen to what you have to say. So that was now the first subheading, what we can learn from King Ahab's example. And uh, we have seen some very important things about what uh, what is required for true repentance. Let's go on now with the next example, next subheading. What can we learn from King Manasseh's example? So paragraph nine, please. Some two centuries later, Manasseh became king of Judah. He may have been even worse than Ahab. We read, he did on a grand scale what was bad in Jehovah's eyes to offend him. Manasseh set up altars to pagan gods, and he even put a carved image of a sacred pole, likely a symbol of sex worship, right into Jehovah's holy temple. He practiced magic, divination, and sorcery. He also shed innocent blood in very great quantity. His vicious murders included making his, his own sons pass through the fire in sacrifice to false gods. So paragraph nine, what kind of king was Manasseh? What kind of king was Manasseh? Um, Okay, let's have um, um, Brother Fortuna. Fortune, please. So when we study the account of Manasseh, we can see that the length of the, the list of things that he did was truly offensive in Jehovah's eyes, much to the extent that a lot of what he did was even in Jehovah's house. So it, it showed that he was a wicked person. Yeah, that's so true. Thank you very much. And uh, Brother Trombley, please. It also mentioned that um, Second Kings that he shed innocent blood in very great quantity, and uh, the other scripture mentioned that Jerusalem was actually filled with this blood. So we see Jehovah definitely uh, saw his actions right there in the, the temple. Yeah, very true. Thank you. And uh, Brother McDonald. Yeah, he he really did very terrible in really all categories. He was likely a very violent man with his vicious murders, um, uh, was an apostate, 
and also uh, engaged in he mentions here like likely a symbol of sex worship so he'll likely engage in very immoral practices too so from every front that a person could offend jehovah he was doing it yes yeah that's very true thank you uh brother walker please. it's also uh, interesting that the bad things he did uh, they had a purpose and its purpose was to offend uh, Jehovah. And that's very different from someone that's doing something bad because they think it's right. Uh, in this case, Manasseh was doing very evil things. And some of them he probably kn knew were evil, but he was just doing them to offend Jehovah. Yeah, very seriously. Thank you. So let's see now how it continues in paragraph 10, please. Like Ahab, Manasseh stubbornly ignored warnings that Jehovah gave him by means of his prophets. Finally, Jehovah brought against Judah the army chiefs of the king of Assyria, and they captured Manasseh with hooks and bound him with two copper fetters and took him to Babylon. There, imprisoned in a foreign land, Manasseh apparently did some serious thinking. He kept humbling himself greatly before the God of his forefathers. He went even further. He begged Jehovah, his God, for favor. In fact, Manasseh kept, kept praying to him. That wicked man was changing. He began to see Jehovah as his God, and he prayed to him persistently. So, paragraph of 10, how did Jehovah discipline Manasseh? And how did the king respond? Uh, Sister Fortune, please. Well, Jehovah first warned Manasseh to turn away from his wicked course. However, when Manasseh refused to listen to Jehovah's counsel, he allowed him to be um, captured and carried off to Babylon. Yeah, great. And uh, Sister uh, Olomo, please. And I also appreciated how Manasseh kept humbling himself and he kept praying to Jehovah. And in verse 12 of 2 um, Corinthians 33, it states he begged for Jehovah's favor. So that was a continuous action of humbling himself and praying for forgiveness. So unlike Ahab, um, this isolation and discipline helped Manasseh. So we see that he was changing from the inside out when he started to see Jehovah as a real person, not just a God, but his God. Yeah, nice point there. Thank you very much. And let's um, also have... Uh, Sister Olomo, please. Sorry, I forgot to put my hand down. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> By the commas, I mean. <laughs> yeah, you can imagine with King Manasseh, uh, Judah was a very large nation, several thousand square miles. And from taking a king that was essentially the man, the, the person in charge, to now being a prisoner in a foreign land and treated like a nobody you can imagine how humbling that uh, that could be. Yeah, so too. Thank you. Uh, Brother Salgado, please. And one thing that we can notice here in this account is that like Ahab, Manasseh have an initial repentance, uh, initial remorse, but the things doesn't stop there. He continues to having more actions, not just the initial remorse, but more things that prove that he was really repentant, that he really feel bad and hurt their feelings because of that, that he did to offend Jehovah. So that turned into actions as we will see. Yeah, great. Nice point. Thank you. And uh, Brother Woodley, please. Yes, and uh, you can clearly tell the difference between Ahab and Manasseh because uh, when Manasseh uh, said that he humbled himself, it was a question mark behind it. Um, and, uh, First Kings chapter 21, verse 29, he said, you know, Ahab has humbled himself on my account. But here with Manasseh's case, there was no question mark. It was clear. It says he kept humbling. He said he kept praying. He begged Jehovah. Uh, so there was no question uh, this man was really changing, and uh, he did it uh, because he realized who the true God was. Yeah, so too. Thank you. Let's co continue and see some more thoughts about uh, uh, Manasseh in paragraph 11, please. In time, Jehovah answered Manasseh's prayers. He saw the changes in that man's heart as reflected in his prayers. 
Jehovah was moved by Manasseh's entreaty and restored him to the throne. Manasseh took full advantage of the opportunity to demonstrate the depth of his repentance. He did what Ahab had never done. He changed his conduct. He actively fought against false worship and promoted true worship. That surely required courage and faith, for Manasseh had been a bad influence on his family, his nobles, and his people for decades. But now, in his final years, Manasseh tried to undo some of the bad that he had done. Likely, he was a good influence on his young grandson, Josiah, who later became a very good king. So we have a read scripture here, then Second uh, Chronicles 33, 15 and 16. Could we have a, a reader for that? Uh, could we have um, Sister Sean Baptiste, please? Second Chronicles 33, 15 reads, He then removed the foreign gods and the idol image from the house of Jehovah and all the altars he had built in the mountain of the house of Jehovah and in Jerusalem, and he had them thrown outside the city. He also prepared the altar of Jehovah and began to offer up communion sacrifices and thanksgiving sacrifices on it. And he told Judah to serve Jehovah, the God of Israel. Yeah, great. Thank you. So according to 2 Chronicles 33, 15, 16, how did Manasseh show that he was truly repentant? Uh, Sister Estrada, please. That he showed he was truly repentant by actively fighting against false worship and promoted pure worship, which this takes a lot of courage and faith. And we know that Jehovah God saw all that Manasseh did to do what was right, to worship the true God the right way. Yeah, nice point, thank you. And uh, we have the fortune. I like how the paragraph brought out that in time, Jehovah answered Manasseh's prayer. So he saw what his heart condition was. Now he wanted to see what Manasseh was going to do. Was he going to follow through? And to do all these other things that were brought in our scripture was going to take time. So Jehovah was uh, sure that he would follow through, but he wanted to see something uh, tangible to look at. Yeah, very true. Thank you. And uh, Sister Saldana? So we see that he had a lot to prove. Um, he had caused a lot of damage and was a bad influence to his family for decades and to his people. So he had a, a lot of ground to cover and, and things to set right. But we see that it, it did pay off because in time he was a good influence to his grandson who became a very good king. Yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah, we remember the, the, the trauma not too long ago. Uh, Brother MacDonald, please. Um, and there were some things that uh, Manasseh would never be able to change. Like, for example, his sons were gone. He couldn't bring them back. And maybe, maybe some people's opinion of him uh, who were righteous for Jehovah, maybe they would have a hard time changing their, their perspective of him. But the point was he was doing the best he could to right the wrongs. Um, and so he really set a good example of true repentance. Yeah, very true. We, we have the picture there also connected with paragraph 11. So um, could we have any comments on what we see there? To emphasize some of the points there. Um, Sister Sean Baptiste, please. We can see in the first picture on the left that um, Manasseh, he had the initial uh, repentance, but he also followed through. On the right, we see that he took up this campaign to destroy the images and um, idols uh, that defiled pure worship. And this would take a lot of humility because initially he was telling everyone to worship these false gods. And now he had to humble himself and um, everyone uh, let everyone know that he was wrong. And so Jehovah could really see by his actions um, that he was truly repentant. Yeah, thank you. Very good. And uh, uh, Sister uh, Cook, please. Oh, Brother Cook, please. <laughs> Sorry. And I like the words that it has underneath the picture. It says that King Manasseh fought against false worship. So he didn't just say, oh, I feel bad about what happened and then kind of let things play out, but he actively fought against it, trying to undo everything. Yeah, great, thank you. And uh, Brother Fortune, please. And kind of focusing on his face in this picture, it's, it's like he has a righteous indignation at this point now. His whole heart has changed, and he is going after this false worship as he would have done if he was a true worshiper of Jehovah from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, thank you. So that's uh, 
a very contrasting example to Ahab. Let's now summarize some of these things about him in paragraph 12. Please. What can we learn from Manasseh's example? He humbled himself and he did more. He prayed, begging for mercy, and he changed his course. He worked hard to undo the harm that he had caused, and he sought to worship Jehovah and to help others to do the same. Manasseh's example gives hope to even the worst of sinners. We see powerful proof that Jehovah God is good and ready to forgive. Forgiveness is possible for those who are truly repentant. Okay, so paragraph 12, what can we learn about repentance from Manasseh's example? So we have many things that we can mention there. Um, let's start with um, Brother Salgado, please. Yes, here one more time, Yehoah teaches that uh, true repentance uh, are accompanied by actions. And he did a lot of good actions. For instance, first, he began to be humble. And he humbled himself, begging to Jehovah for mercy, right? He was thinking on the mercy from Jehovah. He was not thinking on his, his own name, but just to receive mercy. And that created a change in his mind. Now, those things that he liked before, now he despised those. He don't want it to continue in that course. So that is a change in his mind and change, of course, in his life as well. So he tried to just not stop doing the bad things, but undo the bad things. So the list of the actions that he took are increasing more and more. So that is showing truly repentance. Yeah, thank you. Undo, that's the, that's the word there. Thank you very much for bringing that out. And uh, Brother Estrado, please. Estrado. Uh, we can also see what type of God Jehovah is. He is a merciful. Um, Psalms 86.5 Jehovah says good and ready to forgive and even with the worst sinners see here the bad example Manasseh Jehovah is willing to forgive and forgiveness is always possible for those who truly repent yeah thank you uh, isn't that a beautiful lesson also from this example Psalm 86 5 there um brother commerce please you can see with uh, Man Manasseh's example uh he showed us that true repentance isn't a destination, but more of a journey. Uh, it's, uh, you have to separate yourself from that course that you are going on and go on to take that exit, go on to another course, take that road and continue that road. Oh, great, thank you. And Brother McDonald? Uh, kind of going along with Brother Comor's comment, um, it really shows it's kind of a, with true repentance is kind of a stop, turn and go that he, he really, he stopped what he was doing. He turned around in his heart. He humbled himself and prayed to Jehovah. And, and then he went on trying to right the wrongs. He changed his course. He didn't just stop and feel bad about it and stay in the same spot, but he really tried to do the best he could. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Good. There is a beautiful sentence there. I think Manasseh's example gives hope to even the worst of sinners. It's not a beautiful expression of, of Jehovah's personality. So comparing now the works of Ahab and Manasseh, what would we say? What's the difference with the works? Uh, Brother Woodley, please. Well, we can see the difference is that uh, Manasseh definitely took full advantage of uh, Jehovah's mercy uh, by doing the 360 and, uh, you know, turned away from his wrongdoing and uh, definitely changed himself to meet Jehovah's standards, unlike Ahab, uh, who, uh, who truly was better uh, in his actions and did not accept Jehovah's forgiveness. Yeah, great, thank you. So as it says there also, he began to see Jehovah as his God. He repaired his relationship to Jehovah, as we will see later on also. Uh, let's continue now with paragraph uh, 13 to see an illustration about true repentance. Manasseh did more than feel sorry about his sins. That teaches us a vital lesson about repentance. Consider an illustration. You go to a bakery shop and ask for a cake. But instead of a cake, the shop clerk hands you an egg. Would you be satisfied? Of course not. 
Would it help if the clerk explained that the egg is a key ingredient of the cake? Again, of course not. Similarly, Jehovah asks the sinner for repentance. If the sinner feels sorry about his sin, that is good. Such a feeling is an important ingredient of repentance, but it is not the whole thing. What else is needed? We learn a lot from a touching parable that Jesus related. To illustrate a vital lesson about repentance. Um, Sir Sister Salgado, please. Yes, uh, if we need a cake for someone, we get in a, a single ingredient like an X is just is uh, just not enough. Uh, similar, the repentance is the whole recipe. So Jehovah is not satisfied with just one ingredient like regret or temporary expressing sorrow. Yeah, no, very good. Thank you. Good illustration. And um, any other point there? Need to bring out. Um, uh, Brother Trombley, please. And when it comes to the egg, it didn't take much to have an egg. But we know when we bake a cake, it's going to take a little bit of effort. The ingredients all have to be there. So similar to repentance, it's going to take uh, a lot of work to make those works be known but the outcome is, is very good. Yeah, very true. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, Sister Olomo, please. And so to add along with that, um, feeling sorry and regret is just an ingredient to repentance. It's not equivalent to a repentance. And so Jehovah expects and requires a lot more, which requires action and not just emotion. Yeah, very true. And thank you. Brother Commerce, please. And baking uh, time is also required. And sometimes you'll bake a portion of a cake and let that rest and then bake another portion of that cake and let it come together and let those ingredients meld. So that is sometimes necessary for true repentance is, is time. Yeah, good point. Thank you. So that was the second example then, uh, what we can learn from King Manasseh's example. Let's now continue with uh, what Jesus taught in one of his illustrations. Uh, so we have the subheading there, identifying to repentance. So paragraph 14. Jesus told a heartwarming story about a wayward son recorded at Luke 15, 11 to 32. A young man rebelled against his father, left home, and traveled to a distant country. There he led an immoral, debauched life. When hard times struck, though, he did some serious thinking. He realized how much better off he had been while in his father's house. As Jesus put it, the young man came to his senses. He resolved to go back home and seek his father's forgiveness. The moment when the son realized how far he had fallen was important. But was that enough? No. He had to take action. So, prayer 14. In Jesus' parable, how did the wayward son show the first signs of repentance? First signs of repentance. Okay, we have um, Brother Salgado, please. Well, the initial uh, sign was that he uh, meditate, he think about his situation, and he realized that he was better with his father and it was time to return back to back to his father uh, because the things were better for him there. Yeah, great. Thank you. And um, Brother uh, Walker. And in that uh, initial acknowledging his sins, we see in Luke chapter 15, uh, verse uh, 18, when he's thinking in his mind what he's going to say, he says, uh, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. So he's acknowledging not only did he sin against his father, but that he also sinned against Jehovah in his actions. Yeah, great. Very important point. Thank you. Um, let's also have um, Brother Tomlin. 
another uh, sign that he showed repentance was that he came back to his senses, uh, the illustration mentioned. And one of the references mentions that he became keenly aware of the true spiritual condition he was in, how far he had fallen. So that was a, a nice um, to realize that then he could figure out where he needed to go from there. Yeah, thank you. Great, so he had to take action as the last sentence is there. So let's continue to see there in paragraph 15, what more, more was needed. The lost son demonstrated sincere repentance for what he had done. He made that long journey home. Then when he approached his father, he said, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. The young man's heartfelt confession revealed that he wanted to repair his relationship with Jehovah. He also recognized that his actions had hurt his father, and he was ready to work hard to regain his father's favor, even being willing to be treated as one of his father's hired men. This parable is not just a heartwarming story. The principles it teaches should be of interest to congregation elders when they are endeavoring to discern whether a fellow believer has repented of his serious wrongdoing. Okay, Fem 15. So how did the lost son of Jesus parable demonstrate his repentance? And we have a picture also that we can tie in with this. So how did he demonstrate his repentance? Sister Olomo, please. Well, I really appreciated uh, Luke chapter 15, 19. And in the footnote, um, well, he stated in the scripture, make me as one of your hired men. But in the footnote, it mentions, such a man was not part of the estate as were slaves, but an outsider. So he would have um, had to, he would have been lower than a slave um, and he would have no heir to the estate. So he was willing to accept the lowest position in his father's house to gain forgiveness. So I thought this was a nice parallel for us that true repentance is being willing to relinquish everything for Jehovah to gain his forgiveness and to have a renewed um, relationship with him. Yeah, great point. Thank you. Uh, Brother Estrada, please. Also in the picture, not only did he have to realize that he fell, but he had to make that long journey home um, we can see in the picture his effort, the determination. He was willing to do anything to repair the damage. Yeah, that's so true. Very nicely illustrated there. Thank you. And uh, uh, Sister Fortune, please. I'm sorry. I just lost my thought. No, okay. <laughs> that, that's okay. <laughs> that happens to us all. Um, anything else there? Um, uh, Brother uh, Walker. The other uh, interesting point with the picture uh, description is that the wayward son uh, worn out after a long journey. So we see his clothes there. It's you know torn. He's he's like really just holding. On. He's barely holding onto that stick there. So he didn't give up, uh, thinking that you know well the journey is too far. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna continue with this trip. But he realized that what he did was wrong, but he also kept his determination throughout. And so that's a very other uh, important aspect in showing a repentant attitude. Yeah, so, so true, thank you. And uh, Sister Fortune, please. Thank you. I was gonna comment on the idea that when he took his inheritance and left home, no doubt he was unaware of how his actions were gonna affect his father and his family. But on his return, where he came to his father and said, I have sinned against you and against heaven. At this point, we can see in his repentant state, he was fully aware of how his actions were now affecting other people. Yeah, very true. Thank you. Very good point. And um, um, Brother Salgado, please. Something very important in this paragraph is that those uh, these principles will help elders in the congregation because elders, as we see, need help to detect, to, to see if a person is truly repenting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very nice. And that's, it's, as it says there, it's not just a heartwarming story. And that brings us then 
nicely into the next part here, paragraph 16, please. It is no easy task for the elders to determine whether someone who has committed a serious sin is now truly repentant. Why not? The elders cannot read hearts, so they must rely on outward evidence that their brother has had a complete change of viewpoint toward his, toward his sin. In some cases, a person may have sinned so flagrantly that the elders who meet with him may not be convinced that he is genuinely repentant. So paragraph 16, what might be, why might it be difficult for elders to discern the extent of someone's repentance? Why might it be difficult? Um, Sister Saldania? Because they cannot read hearts, so they can only rely on what they see uh, on the outside, the changes that the person has made on the outside. Yeah, that's so true. And um, Brother Cook, please. And although elders can't read hearts, Jehovah still has that commission for them to, to take care of the congregation in that way. So he still gives guidance on how they can determine that real repentance. Yeah, and this illustration is really a wonderful example of that. Okay. Um, Brother uh, Salgado, please. Here, this paragraph also adds that what the elders will find or looking for is onward evidence. So those uh, uh, works that we saw on the examples are the ones that are going to help a body of elders or the elders involved in a, a case with a brother or sister to if, if he or she is truly repented or not. Yeah, thank you. And let's continue now to see an example of this in period of 17. Consider an example. A brother commits adultery over a course of many years. Instead of seeking help, he conceals his immoral conduct from his wife, his friends, and the elders. Finally, he is exposed. When confronted with the evidence, he admits to what he has done and even seems to be very sorry. Is that sufficient? The elders handling such a case would surely need to see more than sorrow. This was not a momentary lapse of judgment, but a wicked course that lasted for years. The wrongdoer did not voluntarily confess. He was exposed. So the elders would need to see evidence of genuine changes in the sinner's thinking, feelings, and conduct. It might take the man considerable time to make the needed changes. Very likely, he would be removed from the, con the Christian congregation for a period of time. So a question to 17. What example shows that a mere expression of sorrow may not be enough to demonstrate sincere repentance. So what example do we have here? Uh, Brother Fortune, please. So we have an individual that has uh, committed adultery over a course of many years, um, conceals it from his wife uh, and friends and family, never comes forward, he's caught in the act. So we may see that uh, this, this in itself, he may show regret or remorse at some point, but it's not enough to show or demonstrate a true repentance. Yeah, that's so very true. Thank you. Well, uh, there, uh, McDonald. Uh, that was interesting. So really, um, the context is a crucial point uh, when determining repentance. Um, as it mentioned here, it, in this particular example, it wasn't a momentary lapse in judgment. It was, it was a series of decisions that the person made. It was a series of choices that they made that led them down that path. So um, really, it's uh, you know, what the person did, how many times, how long of a period. There, there's so many factors to consider in context. Yeah, great. Thank you. Let's go on with the B question. And we have the read scripture there from 2 Corinthians 7.11. Could we have a reader for that? Um, could we have Sister Estrada, please? So for 2 Corinthians 7, 11. For see what a great earnestness your being saddened in a godly way produced in you. Yes, clearing of yourselves. Yes, indignation. Yes, fear. Yes, 
earnest desire, yes, zeal, yes, righting of the wrong. In every respect, you demonstrated yourselves to be pure in this matter. Thank you very much. Yeah, interesting scripture in this context. So as described in 2 Corinthians 7, 11, what is expected of a truly repentant person? What is expected? Uh, Sister Olomo, please. I appreciated how in the scripture it says that you're being saddened in a godly way produced in you, but it doesn't say you being saddened in a fleshly way, but yet it continues to say in every respect, you demonstrate yourselves to be pure in this matter. So it's the demonstration, um, the actions of making yourself pure from your past actions, uh, which of course naturally takes time. So um, that will require removal, removal from the congregation in order for that individual to have reflection. Yeah, great, thank you. And um, we have the fortune. So to go along with that, having godly sadness is different from that worldly sadness someone could cry they could be upset about what they did to their family or friends but what did they do to jehovah that's the key so in this case we didn't see that happening with this uh this brother no that's very true thank you so a very good scriptures scripture for elders to uh, meditate on when they are trying to determine if someone is truly repentant let's continue now to see in paragraph 18 about uh, how an, this fellowship person can show repentance. To show that he is genuinely repentant, a disfellowship person would come to the meetings regularly and follow the elders' counsel to have a good routine of prayer and study. He would also diligently avoid the circumstances that led to his wrongdoing. If he works hard to repair his relationship with Jehovah, he can be assured that Jehovah will forgive him fully and that the elders will restore him to the congregation. Of course, when dealing with the wrongdoer, the elders evaluate each case in the light of its unique circumstances and they avoid judging harshly. So paragraph 18, how can a disfellowship person show genuine repentance and with what outcome? Uh, Brother Estrada, please. Uh, some ways that he could show genuine repentance is by wanting to repair his relationship with Jehovah. And doing that, he would need to go to the meetings regularly, uh, follow a good routine of personal study, prayer. And with that, um, he could have Jehovah's forgiveness in time. Yeah, nice point. Thank you very much. And um, let's also have uh, Brother Trombley. I also mentioned a nice point about avoiding the circumstances that led him initially to do wrong. So not just the wrong that he committed, but maybe there was certain entertainment or association that led him to do that. So that would be a nice thing that that, that individual could do. Yeah, really true. Thank you. Good. And um, there's something mentioned there at the end of the paragraph that is very important for elders to take into consideration uh, Brother McDonald, please. Um, what I noticed at the end of the paragraph there is it says that the elders evaluate each case um, as unique, uh, but and they also avoid judging harshly. And and admittedly, that, that, that can be a challenge depending on the case and, and the severity of the sin committed, um, especially if it was, uh, you know, it could, it could have hurt others or very reprehensible. But um, the elders do well by trying to imitate Jehovah's example and really looking at each case as unique and not judging harshly. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, by the fortune. So if we go back to our examples in the watchtower here, some of the things they did were common, but their attitude and the way they handled things were different. So that's key in how the brothers handle the ones in a congregation. Each person is different. How they react will be different. Yeah, very important point. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let, now we come to paragraph uh, 19 that kind of summarizes and gives us a definition of what true repentance is. So let's have paragraph 19 read, please. As we have learned, true repentance involves more than saying we are sorry that we have pursued a simple course. 
It also involves a genuine change of mind and heart that leads to taking positive action. This includes abandoning a wrong course and turning around to walk in Jehovah's ways again. A sinner's primary concern should be to repair his damaged relationship with Jehovah. Thank you. So we have the read skip to Ezekiel 33, 14 to 16. So could we have a reader for that? Uh, Sister Cook, please. And when I say to the wicked one, you will surely die, and he turns away from his sin and does what is just and righteous, and the wicked one returns what was taken in pledge and pays back what was taken by robbery, and he walks in the statutes of life by not doing what is wrong, he will surely keep living. He will not die. None of the sins he committed will be held against him. For doing what is just and righteous, he will surely keep living. Thank you very much. And what does true repentance involve? Uh, Sister Estrada, please. Well, true repentance involves multiple steps. It isn't just a feeling. Action must take place. Uh, completely abandoning the wrong course and doing what is right in Jehovah's eyes to do his will, to start um, doing, uh, following his standards. Yeah, so too. Thank you very much. And uh, we also have... Um, See, brother, um, brother, uh, commerce, please. Yeah, genuine repentance is not a one step process, it takes a genuine change of, of mind and heart. Uh, and those changes within us is what lead us on that proper course. That is what help, uh, helps us to, to take those positive actions in our life. Yeah, thank you. And sister Sean Baptiste. And uh, from the read scripture in Ezekiel 33, verse 15. I really like what it says in um, verse uh, 15, where it says that the wicked one returns what was taken in pledge and pays back what was taken by robbery. So um, a truly repentant person would want to do whatever he can in his power to set things straight with Jehovah and to make things right. Yeah, very true. Thank you very much. Okay, so what a beautiful paragraph that summarizes what true repentance is. We have the last subheading there. Calling Sinners to Repentance, paragraphs 20 and 21. Jesus summed up an important feature of his ministry by saying, I have come to call sinners to repentance. That should be our desire as well. Suppose we learn that a close friend of ours has committed a serious sin. What should we do? We would only harm our friend by trying to cover up his sin. Such efforts never succeed anyway because Jehovah is watching. You can help your friend by reminding him that the elders want to help. If your friend refuses to confess to the elders, you should inform the elders about the matter, thereby showing that you truly want to help him. His relationship with Jehovah is at risk. Uh, so 2021, how might we help someone who has fallen into serious sin? How might we help someone in that situation? Um, okay, let's have um, Brother Salgado, please. Yes, the best help that we can give to our friends or family is to encourage them to go to the elders in order to repair their relationship with Jehovah because the elders are there to help him, not to uh, do something wrong to him. And uh, if he refuses, then if we do the same and we don't say anything, we are not helping our friend or family. We have to go a step and, and say the elders what we know about our friend. Yeah, very important. Thank you. But the commas? Someone that has fallen into sin is, is likened to fallen into a pit or dug themselves to that pit. And when we find themselves, we may have, have knowledge. Uh, we need to throw them a rope. We need to get them a ladder, get them out of that pit. But if we cover over that sin, it's like taking a shovel and just covering them with dirt. That's not going to help. That's not very helpful now. Thank you. Good points there. Okay, let's continue with paragraph 22. What though, if a sinner has traveled so far and so long into a course of sin that the elders decide he must be disfellowshipped? Would this mean that they have treated him unmercifully? In the next article, 
we will take a closer look at Jehovah's merciful way of disciplining sinners and how we can imitate it. Thank you very much, Brother Saldanya, for your good readings of paragraph 22. What will we discuss in the following article? Um, Sister Salgado, please. Yeah, we will see, uh, we will take a closer look at Jehovah and Jehovah's merciful way of discipline senior and how we can imitate Jehovah. Yeah, that will look forward to that study. Thank you very much. So what a beautiful study and what a beautiful comments we have heard. Thank you so much. Let's summarize this now. How would you answer? What can we learn about repentance from King Ahab's example? Sister Saldania, please. We learned that just feeling bad uh, over a sin is not enough. And also that his repentance was temporary. It didn't um, move him to make any serious change. So his heart condition never changed. Oh, so true. Thank you. So what, um, what, can, uh, what shows that King Manasseh was truly repentant? What shows that? Um, Brother Estrada, please. Uh, we can see here that he humbled himself, he prayed to the true God, abandoned his evil course, and he helped others to do so. So he, it showed the, his heart condition and his true repentance. Yeah, very true. Thank you. And what can we learn about repentance from the wayward son in Jesus' parable? A beautiful parallel there. Um, Sister Olomo, please. Well, we can see that he acknowledged the hurt that he caused Jehovah, and we know that it took effort and courage to return to Jehovah. And so I really appreciated um, how in uh, paragraph 14, it talks about um, it did some, he did some serious thinking. So um, this is a nice parallel for us today to um, humbly and admit and recognize how and where we went wrong. Um, and so that we can correct and not repeat again our, um, our actions, but yet have a resolved and determined heart to make it back to Jehovah. Yeah, thank you. And thank you very much for all your wonderful comments on this beautiful study. So in summary, we have had a very enlightening discussion of what true repentance is. We did get the definition by studying some examples from the Bible, contrasting examples, and also Jesus' wonderful illustration about the lost son. And uh, it really shows that Jehovah is a merciful God and he is ready to forgive as we had that scripture. And in next week's study, we will uh, continue to discuss how Jehovah is a God which in mercy. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to, to listen to all your well-prepared comments. And uh, let's now sing a song of praise as a conclusion. It's song 103. It's the theme, Shepherds, Gifts in Men. We have discussed the role of shepherds, so it's fitting to sing about them. Um, and uh, after the song, we will ask Brother Cook to give the concluding prayer. So song 103, please. Mm -hmm.